Hey everybody, Dr. Osborne here, founder of Gluten-Free Society. Today I have a research update for you. And if you take this information seriously and apply it in your real-time life today, it might just save you a lot of pain and trouble as it relates to autoimmune disease. So what you're looking at um, is a graph or a diagram here. This diagram you can see on the, on the left-hand side, incidence of infectious diseases. So we're looking at over here, rheumat rheumatic fever, hepatitis, tuberculosis, mumps, measles, right? Infectious diseases. And we're going back in time looking at, you know, 1950 to 2000. And we see these dramatic reductions in these different conditions, right? So we see basically from 1950 to 2000, a dramatic drop in infectious disease. Now on the other side of this equation, using the same time frame from 1950 to 2000, we're looking at autoimmune, different forms of autoimmune conditions. So multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type one diabetes, and asthma. And what you see is an exponential increase in these conditions since 1950. So what, what am I showing you such a boring diagram for? Like what is the, the, the walkway or the imperative message here? Again, on the left, infectious disease drops in the same time frame that autoimmune disease exponentially increases. Now, what you'll see on this diagram, you'll see some different elements within this time point. Like, so for example, prior 1950, really this is 1941, the wide use of antibiotics begins. Actually, 1941, 1943, when we see a massive increase in antibiotic use. We also see up here, as we see some of these sharp increases, we see vaccine liability is removed in 1986. And then we also see from this point in 2011, cesarean delivery increases from 20 to 33%, while vaccine schedule increases sevenfold from 1983 to 2016. Now, many of you are going to say that, you know, correlation is not causation. And I agree with that. Look, this is not me trying to tell you that these are the things that are solely responsible for the increase in autoimmune disease, but I'm trying to show you some things so that you can have some intelligent thoughts and conversations with your doctors about them. Now, one other element down here below, you can see chemical use in the U.S., this is 1980, reaches more than 30,000 different chemicals. So what do we have? We have on this side, we have a dramatic drop in infectious disease. In the same time frame on this side, we have the dramatic increase in autoimmune disease and simultaneously, we begin the use of antibiotics, massive vaccination policy, cesarean delivery increases, chemical use in the U.S. reaches 30,000 people. So, taking all those tanks into consideration, let's take a brief jaunt through history. Now, in 1847, rather, hand washing was quote-unquote invented by Ignaz Semmelweis, who's oftentimes referred to as the savior of mothers. Now, this physician found that just by washing his hands, he could reduce mothers dying from puerperal fever, which is, was a type of infectious disease when giving birth. That was, it, was, it was caused by doctors, basically. It was um, iatrogenic. What that means is it was caused by doctors because it was a common practice during this time in history that doctors would be in the morgue digging through dead cadavers, picking up all kinds of infectious bacteria, and then they would walk across the street and deliver babies without washing hands. Remember, this was in an environment in a time where washing hands hadn't been invented yet. Well, this doctor discovered that just by washing hands, you could reduce the, the mortality rates in women at giving birth to children from 10%, which is huge, one in 10 women would die, to under 1%. So that's why he's oftentimes referred to as the savior of mothers. So this is basically hygiene, right? We're talking about solid hygiene. Now let's go back a little bit further in time and talk about the history of water management. So this is just, again, just a brief history on water management. And it'll all make sense as we get through this, so bear with me here. So prior 1820, water and wastewater were managed by private privy and cesspools, meaning that storage cesspools were what contained all the poop and all the pee, you know, from, from industrialized, areas and, and in people's homes and that would leach into the groundwater that would leach into the water potentially infecting it with bacteria right so 1820 here's here's another statistic for you less than five percent of the population lived in urban areas or cities with more than 8,000 people but from 1820 to 1880 there was this huge population boom so along with urban development we had infrastructure issues around hygiene clean water sewage living in close quarters, like it was this culmination of all these things happening at once where all these people were converging and we had this population boom. And again, how did we manage water? 
through cesspools, right, that were able to contaminate the groundwater. And in 1854, a physician by the name of John Snow discovers that water contamination was one of the transmission factors leading to infectious disease. Now, let's go back a minute here because I showed you this diagram and I said from 1950 down to 2000, look, infectious disease dramatically dropped. So kind of setting the stage for this, we don't even know about infectious disease really before Louis Pasteur confirms the germ theory of disease in 1885. But physician John Snow found that contamination of water would cause the transmission of infectious disease. So in 1854, cities slowly began to build water treatment facilities because of this discovery by Dr. Snow. Now, in 1885, those of you who've ever heard of pasteurization, that was actually discovered and created by Louis Pasteur, right? The French chemist who, dis who basically proves that the germ theory of disease, that germs can actually cause disease. Now, in 1914, the U.S. Department of Treasury enacted a set of standards effectively requiring drinking water disinfection leading to a dramatic increase in the use of drinking water chlorination by chlorination treatment plants. So prior to this, we had no way to treat the water. Remember, we were managing water and wastewater through cesspools that would contaminate rivers and underground water sources. But in 1920, here's another factor, new home construction in the U.S. implements the standard of indoor plumbing. So prior to this, again, there was no indoor plumbing. It was cesspools, it was outhouses. Again, areas where we would get groundwater contamination. Now, in 1943, this is where it gets interesting, the use of antibiotics begins on large scale during the World War. And then in 1948, we have this Federal Water Pollution Control Act that gets passed. And in 1951, the U.S. Public Health Service adopts fluoridation of public water policy. And in 1970, EPA was formed. The Environmental Protection Agency was formed. So this is kind of, again, a history of water management prior 1820 all the way up to 1914. There was really no major treatment, right? I mean, from 1854, some cities slowly started to adopt this, but there was no formal law in the books that said, look, water is a potential transmission source for infectious disease. And so it wasn't really until 1914, 1920s that we saw U.S. policy implemented where we started to actually clean the water and try to take steps to prevent contamination. Now, if you are a geek and you love the research like me, here's some research, uh, here's some research articles that you can go look up. Basically, you can go and read all about the history of water. I just gave, basically gave you the summary. But now let's come back to this diagram and let's look at it a little bit differently. Now, I showed it to you earlier up here, if you recall, the rates of infectious disease plummeted between 1950 and 2000. So here we are. We're going to go back from, from before 1950 back to 1900. So what do you see here? You see lots of infectious disease. You see this big, huge rise in influenza. And this actually happened because of the World War. But then we have from 1914, look at what happens in 1914. We see this drop start to occur minus this influenza pandemic that occurs we see that the numbers start to drop. So we have this point chlorination coming into the water. So we're cleaning up the water, right? Hygiene is a major, major factor. From 1920 on, we start seeing indoor plumbing becoming more of, a, of the standard in buildings. So we see clean water, plumbing, which allows for cleaner water and less contamination. And we see laws being passed. 1920, we see laws being passed where where we're now creating a system where water is being basically it's be, de, being debugged right it's being the parasites are being pulled out the bacteria are being pulled out and so we're still continuing to see infectious disease continuing to drop and so when we get to 1940 1941 the first use of penicillin we we see that that death rates again and, and rates of infectious rates from infectious diseases continue to drop and then we get down here to where the first vaccine is introduced. And then, and then over here, the passage of the Vax Vaccination Assistance Act. So before any vaccine was ever even you know, brought to the table, we had this dramatic drop right, in infectious disease. And so again, when we're talking about vaccines, what do we vaccine, vaccinate against? We vaccinate against infectious disease. So we see this massive drop. Again, these are percentages, 800%, right? So all the way dropping all the way down right before any vaccine is introduced to below 200. So this has all been done from here to here has all been done as a result of hygiene, hand washing, 
water contamination issues being solved, indoor plumbing, the discovery of antibiotics and treatment of infectious disease. Like those are all major impact factors that led to the massive reduction in infectious disease. Now let's take this one step further. This was come, this is a quote coming out of the Journal of Pediatrics from 1999. We've come a long way since 1999, but the, the vaccine versus, and, and vaccines and antibiotics versus sanitation. This is what one group of doctors and researchers had to say about vaccines and antibiotics versus sanitation at prevention of disease. In conclusion, the largest historical decrease in morbidity and mortality caused by infectious disease was experienced not with the modern antibiotic and vaccine era, but after the introduction of clean water and effective sewer systems. Very important that you understand that hygiene is a critical element in reducing the risk of developing infectious disease. Look, there's a lot of panic right now. People are out there freaking out because of measles outbreaks. And look, we've got a lot of immigrants coming across the border. They're not being properly screened for disease. They're going to bring in measles and chicken pox and other diseases that are definitely vaccinated against. And they're also going to bring in their hygiene, their poor hygiene habits. So what I'm trying to show you is don't panic. Hygiene has made the biggest reduction in risk over any type of vaccine or any other type of medical treatment. So let's take this further and let's kind of look at this again and let's just plot it in these diagrams. Let's plot it against infectious disease. So what you're seeing in this is a reduction in polio. So what I showed you before was that kind of the history of hygiene led to this dramatic reduction. Okay, if you follow me here on this graph of polio incidents, the dramatic reduction and, and so what we have here is water sanitation, food, Pure Food Drug Act, and the indoor plumbing that happened. And we get this massive reduction all the way up until the first dead polio vaccine was introduced. And by the way, that vaccine created massive problems for many people. But then when we, when we had this secondary vaccine come along afterwards, which was you know around 1960, we are already dramatically seeing a huge decrease in infectious rates from polio. So again, this diagram tracks that incidence both from United States and Great Britain, meaning that both water sanitation, indoor plumbing, and Pure Food and Drug Act created a sanitization standard that massively reduced the quantity okay, of polio. Then we see the same trend with pertussis. Look up here, you know, again, 1900, from 1900, to circa 1935, where that vaccine was actually introduced, what do we see? A massive reduction before the vaccine is even introduced as a result of water sanitation, indoor plumbing, and Pure Food and Drug Act. And then we do it, look at measles, and we see the same scenario, only it's a little bit even more aggressive with measles. We see measles come all the way down extremely low before measles vaccines are introduced. And, and what I'm saying here is I'm not telling you to go get vaccinated or to not go get vaccinated. That's, that's your decision to make. That's a decision you need to make doing your own intelligent research and probably having a, a conversation with your doctor and asking the right questions and, and assessing your own health and the health of your child who might be getting that vaccine and making the decision that you feel comfortable with that you can live with. What I'm trying to explain to you, though, is that hygiene has played far greater of a role in the reduction of immune system problems as it relates to infectious disease far more than vaccines have. Now, that being said, there's a flip side to this because we started this out with the fact that infectious diseases are massively dropping, but what we see on the other side of the coin is that autoimmune diseases are increasing. Now, part of why I'm having this conversation with you today is because, again, what is stemming this change? Now, there's a couple of different theories on autoimmune disease. And one of them is called the hygiene hypothesis. And what that means is that some people take cleanliness too far and they don't get exposed to germs uh, in any big way at all. In other words, washing hands has gone too far, ultra hygiene, ultra bleach use, or ultra chlorine use, like all these things, you can go too far with hygiene. Your body needs some germs because you, your, your immune cells need training. Like you, if your immune cells don't get exposure to any germs, they get fat and lazy. Just like you, if you don't get your exercise, you start gaining weight, you start becoming less muscled because your body's not using those resources. Well, it's the same thing with your immune system. So you have to give your immune system some exposure. But the problem that we're seeing with autoimmune diseases is twofold. One, it's ultra hygiene, but on the other end, it's ultra chemical exposure. So whether 
you want to look at antibiotic use as playing a role in this or whether you want to look at vaccine liability being removed and the vaccine schedule going and increasing sevenfold uh, over a, over a less or over about a 20 year period or if you want to look at the chemical exposures that we've been exposed to from 1980 on more than 30,000 chemicals like I look at all those things as factors not any one of those things being the direct only cause so you have to take all that into consideration it's important to filter your air, it's important to filter your water, it's important to have good hygiene, but it's also important to regulate the quantity of chemicals that you allow to come into your body under the name or under the guise of good health. So if you're on the fence, if you're debating about the vaccine issue, if you're worried or you're struggling to make a decision and you're not quite sure what to do, hit replay on this video and watch it a few times, let it all sink in and then get with a solid functional medicine doctor and have a deeper conversation. But have one that's two-way. Don't allow a doctor to browbeat you or to bully you into thinking that this vaccine component is the only way that you're going to maintain good health or that your children are going to maintain good health. Look, this is Dr. Osborne. Hope this video is helpful and I'm wishing you excellent health. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit the subscribe button below. And when you do that, make sure you hit the bell afterwards. That bell is going to notify you. It's going to allow you to be notified when we have updated videos. We'll see you in the next video. Have a great day.